Well, I struggle terribly to understand uh, sizing up government and uh, making sense of all the economic uh, talk that goes on. So to help us understand, uh, we have with us tonight, well, uh, well, a legendary columnist, I think uh, we can say. Ross Gittins uh, may well be the longest serving columnist in Australian history, he certainly is the longest serving at Fairfax. Possibly the world, Ross, but you're not <laughs> that old, are you? <laughs> Uh, he um, has been an economic columnist and uh, later editor uh, for the Sydney Morning Herald for four decades. And uh, he really is uh, an old school journo uh, now working equally successfully in this, in this uh, well, very different media culture and, uh, and political culture as well. He's covered 41, uh, 40 federal, I'm getting ahead of myself, 40 federal budgets, 16 federal elections, 13 treasurers and God help him, eight prime ministers. His books include Gittin's Gospel, uh, Gittinomics and The Happy Economist and his latest book is uh, a memoir and uh, it's called Gittin's A Life Among Budgets, Bulldust and Bastardry. Uh, our uh, other guests, Miriam Lyons is uh, the co-founder and executive director of the Centre for former, Policy... Former, executive former. director. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Miriam Lyons is the co-founder and former executive director of the Centre for Policy Development. That's because she's recently nicked off to Berlin. Co-author of Governomics, uh, Can We Afford Small Governments with Ian McCauley, who is a policy analyst and uh, formerly a manager in the Department of Industry, uh, still a lecturer at the University of Canberra, and uh, he's done consultancy for the United Nations, uh, OECD, and many, many others. Please give our guests a warm welcome. <laughs> Um, we are living, I think, uh, and, you know, jump in and set me right, in very strange times. Uh, we have a housing boom, yet interest rates are very, very low. Uh, we have um, a, a government that a year ago told us we're in the biggest debt and deficit crisis known to human history, but now is spending money like the ALP. <laughs> I'd like uh, you to tell me first, uh, Ross, you know, what's going on? Well, Tony Abbott is coming to terms with being in government. It's taking him a fair while. Uh, I think they probably realised fairly early in the piece, perhaps when Treasury had a chance to have a word with them, that uh, there was a kind of problem with, with the debt and the deficit, but it wasn't urgent and that in fact immediately starting on it wouldn't be a smart idea and in fact despite all the things that have been said about last year's budget it really didn't start reeling in the, the deficit uh, it didn't plan to do that until 2017 which is still a few a year or two away uh, and that was actually the best part of the budget that they didn't just match manically crunch everything. Uh, but you wouldn't know that from the way they packaged it and the way people reacted to it. And, and of course, this is where I get into a lot of trouble. I like to break budgets up into different dimensions and say that it was g very good from a macroeconomic point of view, but it was also very unfair. Now, I have readers who say, well, look, make up your mind. Is it unfair or is it very good? Well, it's both in different dimensions. Miriam, what do you make of the, the current sort of... the messages, I suppose, that have gone out in, in recent times? I mean, even today, the Treasurer uh, came out... He was asked about housing prices in Sydney and affordability, and he suggested that if people just went out and got a good job, uh, they too uh -huh. could be part of the part of the uh, million dollar plus for a, you know, tiny two bedroom apartment in 
Parramatta or, you know, I mean, it, 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 it is. If we think it's bad in Melbourne, in Sydney, it's, a, it's another planet. How yeah. do you read it? No, I, I always used to be confused about why, uh, for a supposedly very spin-focused government, the former Labor government was so bad at spin, but it's actually worse now. You know, that's a classic example of, 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 uh, of hockey's tin ear. Uh, you know, are we supposed to assume that, you know, people who are, you know, childcare workers, you know, or earn the minimum wage um, are somehow magically supposed to get higher paying jobs that put them in a position to afford, um, you know, to afford to buy a home. It's uh, something that just came out recently I saw was showing that there are only five suburbs in Sydney on which people can afford to rent on the minimum wage at the moment. Five. <laughs> Sydney's quite big. <laughs> okay. um, so it, it, we're really in a ridiculous situation there. I'm, I'm, I'm in furious agreement with... Uh, Ross, that um, it is a very good thing that we saw the narrative of a deficit crisis change as soon as the coalition got into government. It has been a little bit surreal, you know, a little bit kind of we are at war with the deficit. We have never been at war with the deficit. Um, and, and, you know, that is strange. But I, I would far prefer a little hypocrisy and inconsistency to continued idiocy and, you know, the idea that we should you know, have an absolute breakneck return to surplus in such uncertain economic times. You know, and very few economists would stand up and say that that was a good idea and uh, it was certainly bad socially. I would maybe just pick up on one thing. If, if a budget is unfair, I would argue that in the long run it is also bad macroeconomically. Oh. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, a new OECD report that's just come out recently uh, which confirms previous evidence that shows that inequality is really bad for growth. Um, so it may not show up in the short term, but in the long term, I don't think that you can have an unfair budget and call that macroeconomically responsible. Mm. Ian? Well, on the budget, uh, clearly, as Miriam says, we've... That the government had to realise suddenly, hey, we are not recovering from the GFC as fast as we thought we would, and really admit that we need an ongoing stimulus to the economy. I think where uh, Miriam and I uh, on certainly agree that uh, we needed that stimulus, but it was a wrong, and it has been still the wrong form of stimulus. It's in the form of not collecting enough public revenue, or let's let's say tax in in clear terms. Uh, and rather than the stimulus which would be required from decent capital spending. One, one of the points we make in the book is that in comparison with similar countries, and we've had a look at the 18 OECD countries which are roughly similar to Australia in terms of income, the set of o a lot of economists say, oh, look, we're not too bad by OECD comparison. Um, but the OEC does include some rather weird and wonderful countries, and we restrict our analysis to those 18 countries that are, uh, are reasonably prosperous, and we sit in about the middle of that group. We have by far the smallest public sector of those 18 countries, uh, and we're not just talking about a few percentage points. We're talking about you know, something in the order of 12 or 13 percent of GDP. We're talking about uh, uh, you know, 200 billion dollars, and that's. Uh, yeah, as I say, we're starting to talk about real money um, com compared with the average. You know, we're talking about enough to uh, fund high-speed rail and upgrade all of our urban transport, public transport and roads, to implement Gonski, to have a properly funded Medicare, which we could do if we just came up around the average of those countries. But we are trying to get by with an absurdly small government because of this dogma that somehow small government is good for the economy. And we point out in various ways that small government ain't good for the economy. You know it in, uh, you know, particularly here in Melbourne, um, you know, toll roads, aren't they marvellous things? Well, what would be wrong with keeping free roads funded by a higher level of um, gasoline taxation? Uh, Medicare, uh, you know, we're told go out and take out private health insurance, but private health insurance returns to the health system around about uh, 86 cents on the dollar, whereas Medicare and the tax office return about 96 cents on the dollar. What's the point in saying, you know, in the name of small government, we're going to give you a tax cut, we're going to save you a dollar a week, uh, but by the way, as a cost of 
shifting those functions to the private sector, you're going to be paying a dollar ten, a dollar twenty, a dollar fifty, and for something which is often far less equitable than had the government done it. No better performance, just higher cost. Very um, popular, or, or um, unpopular is not the right word, but a, a, it's not a. Um, it's not something that's in fashion at the moment, is it? Promoting bigger ca uh, government and paying more tax. Ross, is there? Is that, can you see a time in the you know reasonable future where these kind of arguments would get a real hearing in our federal system? Well, not until we've got politicians who are a lot braver than uh, the ones we've got at the moment. Uh, I. I don't have any problem with uh, all of that. It is true that we have a very small public sector compared with other rich countries. It is true that our tax burden is uh, among the lowest. It's around about the Americans, and the Americans usually have a bigger budget deficit than we do. Hmm. Uh, and pe people, I mean, <laughs> people just don't know that. Or Incredible or misconception around it that, is, isn't there? It is, it is. But people yeah. have this idea that taxes are very high in Australia. Well, they are compared to uh, some Asian country that doesn't have a welfare state, that doesn't uh, pay for people to go to hospital, doesn't give people age pensions, doesn't give people unemployment benefits. Relative to that, yes, we do uh, pay a lot. But relative to the countries that we compare ourselves with, America and the whole of Europe, we get let off very lightly. And a big part of the reason for that is because we have this heavily means-tested welfare system, which is not the case in, even in America, mm -hmm. where we have this thing that says, if you don't need it, we're not going to give you the age pension. Uh, but we've actually developed a culture where we're fighting against that. And a lot of people who don't really need the age pension are trying to find ways to get it or to get some of it. And increasingly, we're, we're undermining that uh, extremely yes. targeted welfare state through the um, tax breaks, you know, so the superannuation tax concessions, uh, private health insurance rebate, obviously, you know, negative gearing. We have so many different types of yeah. tax breaks that are very, very heavily skewed towards the well-off. Retirement saving is the classic case. We have an age pension where, which is given out on the basis of do you need it or don't you need it? If you don't need it, you're not getting it. But then we have this other thing called superannuation tax concessions, which work on just about the opposite basis. The less you need, the more we'll give. And of course, we've got this debt obsession. Uh, you know, as Ross has said, no, we don't have much public debt. But uh, we are trying to, what Miriam and I are trying to do, get people to look at our public accounts the way you'd look at a corporate balance sheet. We don't have many public assets. And we have this very low debt, but a badly run down set of public assets. Um, uh, we, we, you know, when we talk about, say, uh, urban public transport or quite mundane things like um, sealing of roads uh, or provision of services in outer suburbs, um, we do not have the public assets that a developed country should have. So it, it's uh, ridiculous to talk about uh, we must reduce debt without asking uh, well, what's the other side of the balance sheet look like? And uh, f to have a mature discussion, we really should stop, say, comparing ourselves with, say, Greece or whoever, who have used their debt to finance current consumption. No, let's not definitely not do that. Uh, uh, well, it's an absurd ourselves. comparison. Mm. It is utterly absurd. Whenever you hear some businessman, and they're usually businessmen, saying, mm. well, we're, you know, we're, all, we're not quite... At where Greece is, <laughs> that is absolute hmm. rubbish. Mm. It just is. Uh, we need to be closer to where Germany is, you know, where you've got debt of around a, about three times in relation to GDP of ours, but good public assets. All right, so explain this to me. We have a smaller, tighter public sector than most of us think, and we've we don't have a debt and deficit crisis as we were led to believe. Our taxes aren't as high as comparable 
developed countries. And Ross, you write in your book that we have uh, our economic managers are world class, in fact, comparable to our athletes. Why is everything so confused? Is it well, just that, simply that politics? Is, is it? Well, it's. it's and, also, and if it is, is that bad those for the terrible economy? People in the media mm. <laughs> <laughs> who have this idea that their readers and viewers are only interested in bad news and so we only tell them bad news. But these guys... We see all these g bits of good news float past and we think, well, we wouldn't want to tell people about that. <laughs> but these guys say this stuff. I mean, if, if, if Abbott or Hockey had said one more time, debt and deficit disaster, debt and deficit crisis, uh, I mean, they... Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want to defend... Uh, the media, either in in as a as a wholesale uh, group, and you write really interestingly about the media in the last oh. third of your book. It's fascinating. It's not our topic uh, tonight, but it really is uh, interesting what you have to say about it with this longer view lens. Uh, but surely this isn't isn't the media's fault. Oh no, no. In fact, actually, one of the things I say in the book is that there is a very symbiotic relationship between the politicians and the media, and uh, w when you put the two together, what comes out is not all that uh, much in the public interest. We're, we're bad for each other, I think. We're bad influences on each other. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we often pick on the politicians, uh, and, and, and lots of other people, saving my good self, pick on the media. But, in fact, there's enough blame to be shared between them. But, mm. Ross, you also uh, point out, I think, that it's far too easy for people in the media to accept the government's frame of economic problems. And too often do I hear, uh, you know, the quality media, including ABC journalists, pick up terms like, uh, well, budget disaster, budget repair, we must repair this budget, implying someone's broken it. Uh, the burden of taxation, rather than saying you know, what we pay for public goods. Uh, it's the way so many people so easily slip into the rhetoric of small government. Well, I think that's true, and I think that's partly because the media isn't as well educated as they could be, and aren't really don't have the confidence to say, he said this, but it's not right. I know it's not right. I understand this issue. And uh, I can explain to you why that wasn't right. Uh, and and uh, p particularly political journalists, they often don't understand the underlying stuff. I hear, I hear people in Canberra talking about the structural deficit. And I think you're only saying that because it sounds very profound, <laughs> the structural <laughs> deficit. I, w I, I really want to get to these people and say, just explain to me what the structural deficit is. How do they work it out? <laughs> and I think we might find we're not quite sure about that. Uh, and so that means that it's too easy for the media to accept the things that politicians say, particularly the things governments say, and assume that, well, it's come from the public servants, it's come from Treasury, these people really understand it, so it must be right. Well, often it isn't right. And part of the problem is that... Uh, part of the problem is that the media doesn't have enough people who are confident in their own area because of their own qualifications to say, he says this, he says that, but let me tell you, the truth is over here. Uh, but the other thing is, there's also a competitive spirit in the media, and I know we're not here to talk about the media, but a competitive spirit that says, somebody has just said that if the government goes ahead with this policy, they'll destroy uh, 5,000 jobs in the, in the coal fields. And they've got a study to prove it. Does anyone look at the mm. study? Mm. No. Does anyone say, oh, what I'll, I'll ring up an economist and ask them if they are, if they are 
persuaded by this study. Or who funded no. the study. Why, yeah. why, why spoil a good story? Mm. This is a great story. 5,000 jobs to go, maybe. Don't or let all the, the facts or all get of the jobs away. that might have existed, you know, had Australia's dollar not been pushed so high by the mining boom. Mm. Mm. You know, that, that kind of question very rarely gets asked. Indeed. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Uh, Miriam, uh, what do you think about the, the sort of, uh, you know, this quote from uh, Ross's book that the world-class economic managers, how efficient is our government is another way of, I guess, asking that question. Well, we get enormously good value from our public sector in Australia overall. You know, we get amazingly world-class outcomes for a pretty bargain basement budget. And part of that is because the spending is so very targeted. Um, and part of it is because we do have a you know, comparatively good, efficient public sector. I mean, there's always room for improvement. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep on looking for ways to do things more effectively. Often uh, we look in the wrong places for efficiency improvements in government, I think. So the, the efficiency dividend, so-called, is a really classic example of that. You know, in what world just an arbitrary, across-the-board cut produce, you know, innovation, which is what you genuinely get efficiency from? Quite often, a genuine improvement in efficiency will result... It would require some kind of structural transformation or some kind of upfront investment, you know, whether that's better you know, access to equipment, whether that's better upfront training. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of areas that we could be looking for efficiency that are quite different from the way we currently assume that the it should be done. The efficiency dividend is a classic case of Orw Orwellian language. Mm. It means the exact opposite of what it says. It actually breeds inefficiency because it just uh, does this mindless cutting where they just have to... and. They've been cutting away with this efficiency dividend every year for at least a decade, probably a lot longer. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. And then actually down, all, any, f any fat that they've managed to get has gone and they're down to the bone. And so now the efficiency dividend means that they lay off more public servants every year. And then we wonder why they can't give the government the good advice that they should, particularly... And I suspect that part of the problem with last year's budget, the obvious problem, was that the government just kind of asked... essentially asked the Business Council what they wanted oh. and then tried to, to implement a, a mildly cut-back version of that. And they... And I'm, I looked at that and I think, if that's what the econocrats were telling them to do, they weren't getting good advice. And beware of this word efficiency. It's thrown around with partisan vigour. Uh, to take a couple of examples, say hospitals. Uh, yes, if you look at the average cost per bed day in a public hospital, it's higher than the private hospitals, and people often quote that. But when the Productivity Commission went and looked at the different case mix, uh, the fact that the uh, private hospitals tend to take the easy cases, nine, uh, nine to five, Monday to Friday sort of operation, and find that um, the really difficult medical cases go to the uh, public hospitals. Guess what? There's no difference in their efficiency. Same in public and private schools. And we hear, yeah, we hear the same employment services. The uh, private sector providers pick the low hanging fruit. And we have a, there's a statement which just comes in our book a couple of times. It's a quote from uh, Dutch uh, Leonard, Herman Leonard of uh, Harvard University, the hard jobs are left to the public sector. Mm -hmm. And the government has to pick up the jobs where the private sector can't make a buck, uh, where it's just too difficult or where the incentives are wrong. So of course, any superficial look at efficiency will put the public sector in a bad light. But any in-depth analysis usually puts the public sector in a very good light. How big is the, the changing relationship between the government and the public sector? I mean, I, I can think of things such as... It used to be fairly standard that ministers would have somebody... They'd get somebody from the public sector to come and work in their offices, mm -hmm. perhaps their chief of staff or uh, a speechwriter, but somebody that really knew how the, the, the relevant department worked. Now, I think, maybe, I think it was um, under the Rudd government, 
there was one minister, I, I think, who had any one person in a senior role in their office. So that crossover experience, uh, I, I was stunned when I was told that. Um, I'd have to check for sure which government, but I think it was uh, Rudd Mark I. Uh, Ross, how th those smaller sorts of changing cultural things in that relationship, do they matter? Or oh, is yes, they do. I think they're very important, and I think you're right. In earlier times, a higher proportion of the people who are in the minister's office were, were come as volunteers from the department, and there was an ethic that said if you wanted to work for a Labor government, a, a Labor minister... Uh, that's fine. We, we've, Labor won the election. We've got to supply them with people. When they move on, you'll come back to the department. They'll be replaced by the coalition. We'll ask around to see if any of our people want to go and work for the coalition. And when they come back, that, that will all be just part of their professionalism. That was the way it used to work. That was the way it worked in Keating's office when he was treasurer. I was actually surprised and a bit shocked when he got all, most of his people from, from the department. Mm. Uh, and, but he made it work. Uh, but these days, with the rise of, the, of careerism in politics, of young people leaving university and pretty much going straight to work for a uh, minister or to work for uh, a, a union as a researcher or something, then more and more of the jobs in the private office of the ministers on both sides now, it used to be mainly a Labor thing, but it's increasingly being a Liberal thing too. People make a lifetime career out of politics and they start off as an advisor in the office and they try to get themselves pre-selection and they get onto the back bench and they, they just work their way up. They're, if their objective is to at least retire as a cabinet minister and hopefully prime minister. Now, uh, that's just been one of the developments. It hasn't been a very helpful one. And one of the great de new developments that's quite uh, anomalous in the Westminster system is that the people in the minister's private office act with the minister's personal authority but can't be held accountable. The minister will say, I'm terribly sorry, someone on the staff did that, and don't worry, I have counselled that person. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and sometimes the people in the minister's staff can be really domineering and rude to the most senior public servants in the department. And that's not a good thing either. There's not a, an institutional memory, I suppose, being created either no, in, the, in no. the same way. And and it just means that the people in there, you know, people used to complain about Rudd's office and Rudd's advice coming from all these, well, they weren't quite teenagers, but they were in their 20s. Uh, and they're not necessarily the people with the greatest experience of how things work in practice. Uh, and that can, that can be uh, quite a problem. And the other thing is that if you're on that career path, it's a political career path. And you think about issues much more in political terms, how is this going to wash with the electorate, can we get away with it, than, than thinking about it in terms of is this the thing that we should be doing for the country that will mean that when eventually we get thrown out, we'll be able to look on our, back on our period in office and say we did some worthwhile things. Mm. It's interesting, I, I don't think I have seen or heard a whisper anything about Peter Credlin since the leadership <laughs> non-challenge. It's like she has just disappeared. Mm. Uh, Miriam, what do you make of the relationship between uh, the government and the, the public service? Um, so we devote a whole chapter to this uh, in Governomics, um, partly because most of the book is really looking at the role of government in the economy uh, based on different forms of market failure. So we thought it was only fair that we devote a chapter to different forms of government failure right. and what can be done about them. You know? And in most cases, you, know, you don't really have an option if you want the things that government does best um, done 
uh, done well, then you know you, you don't have an option but to make sure that government does genuinely serve the public interest and that politicians don't get in there and stuff it up. Um, so you know we, we spent a while thinking about this and you know advocated very strongly for public servants to be allowed to, uh, get on with serving the public, which, yeah. you know, they tend to have a strong professional ethic to do um, and be very motivated to do and very frustrated when they're not allowed to get on with that job and instead have to spend uh, too much time focusing upward to meet the minister's demands mm. for political cover instead of outwards to serve, you know, to serve citizens. Um, now, that kind of sounds like, you know, a great piece of advice, but how on earth would that ever happen? Uh, I guess, you know, really the best argument uh, from the perspective of a politician for doing that is that if you only have careerists around you, then you are unlikely to get frank and fearless advice. Right. And frank and fearless advice is, in fact, in your own interests. Yes. Um, for the same reason that Machiavelli, Machiavelli you know, wrote about in The Prince all those years ago, if you are only surrounded by yes men and women, um, then you are unlikely to be able to see the real problems that you're facing clearly. And ultimately, that will come back to bite you. That's Maybe not within a single term, but you know, in the longer term. That's so obviously true but it's surprising how many politicians don't uh, see it or certainly don't act on it and when you get governments that come in and say we'll just in our first act we'll just sack a few department heads as John Howard did and as Tony Abbott did that's a way of saying don't you give us fearless advice because we might lop your head off. Now, any politician that doesn't want the bureaucracy saying, Minister, you're sure you want to do this? What about that? What about that? What about that? Uh, then those politicians are asking for trouble and they are, they are discouraging we don't know. As the members of the public and as the media, we don't know what the bureaucrats say to the politicians in private. But if it was true that they are now far more compliant and far less willing to give ministers tough advice, I don't think that's a good idea, minister, for the following reasons. If that's true, then you sh it shouldn't surprise us that governments like uh, the Abbott government can get off the track so quickly in their term. It, it's, there is part an explanation in what happened about 15 years ago in the Howard government. Now, it didn't make the front pages of the papers or even the, it wasn't a barbecue stopper in Canberra, but the Public Service Act was changed by the Howard government to say public servants will be responsive to the minister. Quite different from any notion of responsibility. Um, it, it's that the public servant is no longer officially serving the public, but is serving the minister. And that is built into legislation. Terrible bit of legislation. Ross, um, you, uh, you have two, you've got a few, quite a few interesting lists in your book, favourite. Prime Ministers and Treasurers and, uh, and, and so on. But one of the ones that, uh, that really captured me, you list the ten reforms that transformed Australia. Um, perhaps you can rattle a couple of them off so that the audience uh, get the, 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 the feel of, the, the, of what you were talking about. But then I'd like you to add to that um, a reform that you wish was on that list? Yes, well, the list is one that if you were around in the, uh, the mid-80s, you should remember, floating the dollar, deregulating the banks, uh, phasing out uh, protection of manufacturing. A lot of people in Melbourne remember that bit. Uh, but there are other reforms, a lot of privatisation of banks, you, you well know that there was a time when the federal government had a bank and most states had their own bank. Some of the states also had insurance companies. All of those things are long privatised and I don't believe that it, that bit of it has made much difference. 
Things like privatising airports, I think, has made a mm. big difference because airports are essentially monopolies. They're local monopolies. You can't really have a lot of competition between airports in one big city. Uh, and and so, so there's all of that. But if I could add a reform, it would be some kind of system where we could get thoroughgoing cost-benefit analysis of infrastructure projects that somehow or other the politicians couldn't get to. <laughs> because oh boy, do we wish we could we, get that, If Victoria. we could have those, yeah. and if you could convince some outfit that this, the benefits were double the cost, then there ought to be far less argument about saying borrowing most of the money to undertake this project is in the country's long-term interests. And that's the point that Ian was getting to earlier. Borrowing for infrastructure, provided it's, it's worthwhile infrastructure, provided uh, there is a genuine social need for it, the fact that, you know, if you build a road, it's going to be there for 40 years, 50 years. It's not unreasonable to ask our children to pay part of the cost of that because in 40 years' time they'll be using it. Mm. And so you don't, and the idea that we couldn't possibly uh, build a road until we could afford to pay for it for cash is just a crazy mm. idea. It's an idea that. If business used that idea, nothing would happen. Mm. Mm. Ian, what would you add to that? You know, a list of what would be at the top of your uh, uh, fantasy uh, reform? Yeah, I mean, the top would be r real action to try to stabilise the economy. Now, there are, uh, there are theories of stabilisation that you pull this lever and that lever called monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, and uh, both we and Ross go into, into that. But real stabilisation means thinking... Uh, you know, what's the, going to be the effect of the next commodity cycle, which will probably occur in about 20 years' time? Will that upset our exchange rate again? How destabilising is it to have um, a, a, a finance sector which is serving itself rather than the real economy? Uh, how can we rein this in so that it is serving the real economy? Uh, and generally paying some attention to the whole structure of the Australian economy. And, you know, the one that uh, really... Um, uh, is just shining up there in lights, is what uh, are we going to do in a world that does not want uh, carbon dioxide pollution? How are we going to reshape our economy uh, in order to cope in a world where uh, we recognise that we cannot go on emitting carbon? And, of course, you know, the G7 today uh, just said, uh, you know, perhaps 100 years is a bit too long, but just said, hey, we, we want a world without uh, carbon-generated fuel. Um, this is coming from the most conservative leaders in the world. And how do we uh, get the human capital, uh, and Gonski, of course, had part of the um, suggestion there, to cope with our needs in the, uh, over the next 20, 30 years, when we've got to compete on the basis of our wits and not what we dig up from the yeah. ground? See, we have a double problem here. The first problem is how are we going to minimise perhaps even eliminate the use of, uh, car, uh, of um, fossil fuels in our own economy. But the other thing is, what are we going to do for export income when the rest of the world doesn't want to buy our coal? Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, this is not a necessarily a forward-looking reform, but you look back at the last mining boom and think about what position we would be in now if we had acted as Norway has done. Um, you know, Norway basically treats their oil and gas companies like the plumber. You know, they're there to do a dirty job, um, and they get a fair rate, but they're not at all confused about who owns the resources. Um, you know, there's 90% gas gas royalties. Um, and the result of that is they put it into a sovereign wealth fund. That sovereign wealth fund is heading towards $1 trillion under management, owns around 1% of the world's stocks. Now, that is a massive source of fiscal resilience for Norway um, when, you know, they no longer have uh, stuff to, to yeah. pump up and, and ship off. So In a sense, they've had a resources boom and they haven't had a resources boom 
at the same time. Mm. Mm, exactly. They've had the resources boom. They're shipping the stuff off. They're making money out of it, but they're not letting it disrupt their own economy. Which gets to what Ian was saying on, you know, actually taking stabilisation seriously. Yes. In fact, Australia probably would have been better off if all of the doom and gloom nays naysayers around the mining tax had been right mm. and that it would have massively <laughs> slowed the boom down. We would now be in a better position. Yes. You know, we only get to sell these resources once. It would have been in our interest to have them sold slower at a higher price and have more revenue coming in so and how spread come around. Where the, you know, our... Our economic managers are as good as our athletes. Ah, oh, well, they are. They are. Well, the, the proof of that is very simple. And Joe Hockey uh, was emphasising this in the budget uh, last month. And that is, we are entering our 25th year since the last severe recession. Now, no... I think maybe one other country can say that. But, but the Europeans can't say it. The Americans certainly can't say it. They've had... Uh, even the Asians can't say it. We skipped out on the Asian financial crisis. We didn't have the uh, tech wreck. Uh, and we didn't really have a very severe dose of the GFC. We didn't have the uh, Great Recession, as they call it, which has still got the whole of Europe bogged down and which the Americans are only now starting to get their head above. Now, if that doesn't... It, and uh, you can say, oh, yes, that's because we had the resources boom. No, that's not, that's not enough to explain it. I mean, Wayne Swan makes your number three treasurer on that alone, doesn't he? Yes, he does, because of the way we could have been caught up in the GFC, because uh, at the time, business and consumer confidence plunged in Australia, mm. as it did in every other country, including even China. And that happened because of the globalisation of news. That happened because every night, Australians went home, turned on the telly, and heard about another bank wobbling in America tonight, and tomorrow night it'd be some bank in Belgium. Now, if that doesn't scare the pants off people, nothing does. And we had to get... And so we could easily have had a self-fulfilling recession. The way recessions get started is that people think, I can tell a recession's coming, and... I may lose my job, but I've got this big mortgage. And what's more, I've got, uh, I owe about three grand on my credit card. Now, what happens if, we, if the recession comes along and I lose my job? That's going to be really tough. I might lose the house. So what am I going to do about that? I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll tighten my belt right now. The trick is that if enough people do that, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why I think that the way uh, the Rudd government handled that period in uh, late 2008 and early 2009 was just perfect. Uh, and their cash splash was really smart. And people who thought they knew a bit about economics were saying, oh, well, you send people these cheques for $900. If they don't immediately go out and spend it, it's wasted money. That turned out not to be true because what a lot of people did was take the 900 and pay it off their credit card bill. Um, and the trick to that is that once they'd done that, and maybe a particular household might have got a couple of... $900 amounts. Once they'd done that, they started to be less anxious about the future. And that meant that uh, the economy was less likely to just spiral down into a recession. The other good thing that happened at the time was that employers were feeling the pinch. And unemployment did rise. But 
What we didn't get is what happened in most other countries, which is the, the usual kind of mass layoffs. What was much more common in that episode was employers saying, I could lay off a lot of workers, but let's have a thing where we just move to, a, everyone keeps their job, but we move to a four day week and we pay for a four day week. Everyone has, takes a day off. Uh, that turned out to be a much better way of cushioning the downturn in the demand for employers' products and making that a fairly temporary episode. We had uh, Wayne Swan here actually uh, last year as a guest of the Fifth Estate and you can hear his podcast if you go to the Wheeler website where he talks about the day uh, uh, after the first handouts where he found out that we hadn't gone into recession and his description of that just being the best moment of Wayne Swan's <laughs> life. Uh, it was uh, quite a, an interesting I uh, had. Uh, let me just tell you this. I had a very interesting discussion with his principal private secretary. He was a very bright fella. And I said, how did you work out the timing of these cash splashes? Because they, they kind of had two one that they announced in October and another package in February. And this guy was very reluctant to admit to me yeah. that they had timed these uh, cash splashes, these sending out of checks to people, uh, to ensure that although they had one quarter where the economy went backwards, they pumped up the next quarter so that it didn't go backwards. And they were dealing with a mentality in the media, which makes no sense. I've been preaching against this for decades, but to no effect, which says that if you get two negative quarters in a row, it's a recession. If you get one really big negative in one quarter, but the next quarter is zero, that's not a recession. <laughs> uh, and, and they played those silly people off against each other and they timed all those cash splashes to ensure that if we got another negative quarter, it wasn't immediately next to the first <laughs> negative quarter. And this guy was very, very reluctant to admit this to me because he thought that I would think this was playing politics. I thought it was playing economics and I thought it was very smart. Wayne Swan certainly didn't put it quite that way in his <laughs> book or his conversation here. Um, we're running out of time and I want to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience. But first, uh, I want to ask each of you about uh, the R word because, you know, we're all terrified of a recession. Uh, the Treasurer came out last week and said anybody who thinks there's a recession coming is a clown. Now, Ross, you think there's a recession coming, but of course you don't say when. But I want to go to Ian and Miriam first and then, Ross, you can, you can uh, uh, finish it off on this, on this topic. Well, sometime... We're going to have to live within our means. I mean, this is a country that's been living on huge inflows of foreign capital uh, to balance our very big deficits on current account. And this week we had a shocker. Even after uh, we had a very strong mining boom, we haven't had a surplus on current account. That's, in other words, uh, exporting more stuff than we're importing uh, since 1974. And that's rather a long time to expect the rest of the world to support us. Sometime that truth is going to hit. And I, I would rather see a mild recession now than the sort of awful awakening we might get an Argentinian-type crisis if we keep on going the way we're going. And if we have a mild recession now, I would hope that a government has a good sense to respond with something of a stimulus to... Uh, uh, to stop it getting too bad rather than austerity because the cost of austerity, uh, as is sh shown in Greece and Spain, is massive. It's a, a cost which just echoes down generation to generation. But we need a bit of a wake-up, we need a bit of a shock, and, we're, uh, uh, and that would be far better. Just as it is, you know, if you've got teenage children 
you hope to hell that they learn somehow that they get their car into a skid but you know, don't hit a pole. Uh, we need that sort of a shock. I think we need to change how we see our economy. I'm not sure um, that I would use the word shock as the, <laughs> as the appropriate change what, that we what need. What we need is a short, sharp shock. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I, I think a, a recession is inevitable at some point. You know, the, 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 the uninterrupted um, growth run is obviously not going to last forever, but I think predicting exactly when that would happen is a bit of a mugs game. Um, I, you know, there are a few things that are obviously structurally unsustainable in Australia's economy. Um, you know, one is the, the massively overpriced uh, housing market in, in Sydney and Melbourne to some extent as well. Um, and, you know, at some point we are going to have to have a structural adjustment that deals with the fact that we have so many different policies in Australia that skew investment towards houses as opposed to a whole lot of things that could potentially be much more productive. And I suspect that that you know, people that those animal spirits will react negatively to a sudden drop in the value of houses, even though that you know that piece of you know paper that you might get in the mail from somebody saying, "Well, we estimate that your house is, is worth this much," that that may not be worth the paper that it is mm. printed on, um, but it makes people feel wealthy and therefore feel reassured. Um, and I can imagine that you know at some point th that adjustment could spark off a recession. Um, and I would absolutely back up what Ian said. In that case, we should not respond with austerity. You know, we've seen in so many cases, you know, the, the broad economic cost and the, you know, the very um, real human cost of that kind of approach. You know, in Greece, you, you had um, HIV infection rates going through the roof because they cut back on preventative um, health uh, programs, you know, you, you see massive increases in child poverty, um, which affect people not just in that moment. That affects, uh, you know, a cohort of kids for their entire lives. You know, at a critical point when the brain is developing, if the parents are unemployed, if they're, you know, stressed out, if they're fearful, um, that all has flow-on effects for the next generation. Uh, you know, the, you know, there are so many, so many. Um, you know, extremely kind of tragic human costs to austerity policies. So we absolutely don't need to go down that path. And in terms of the economy overall, it's also extremely unwise. I mean, we saw the International Monetary Fund, which initially was, you know, full, you know, all guns blazing um, for, for cutbacks, come back and say, ah, oh, actually, we kind of miscalculated the flow-on effect of government spending cutbacks, and it does a bit more damage to the economy than we thought, mm. um, you know, which made it clear that you can, in fact, do um, deficit reduction spending cuts, which increase the deficit because they do just that much damage to the economy. Um, and in that context, I am worried that the latest budget from um, the federal government has been received in the media so much better than the previous government. You know, it's essentially what they've done is shift from a kind of full frontal attack on the poor to a sort of flanking side manoeuvre. Um, you know, if you look at the, the NATSEM uh, rep report and modelling on the impact of, um, of that budget, including some measures which, to be fair, the Senate will probably knock back, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but if you include the whole intended package, um, that it affects the um, the disposable income, the household disposable income of the bottom fifth of Australian households uh, negatively by about 7%, I think, over the next yeah. four years. So why would you have uh, a budget that was so skewed towards having um, the people who are most likely to go out and spend their entire paychecks every month, mm. as opposed to squirrelling them away, um, in, you know, potentially in international investments. You know, it's, it's, it's the most economically damaging way of trying to constrain government spending. Ross. No one's abolished or conquered the business cycle, the cycle of boom and bust. So you will never get me to say, oh, no, I see no prospect of us having a recession. Picking when it's going to happen is much harder. But the Reserve Bank has been very frank about the battle, and Treasury too, have been very frank about the battle that they're fighting. There is, uh, there has been a lot of investment by the miners in, uh, in new mines and natural gas facilities, 
and that is just going to stop very, very sharply mm. this year and next year. That's why interest rates are so low. The Reserve Bank is trying to encourage all the industries other than mining to get out there and do some investment, some physical investment in uh, machinery and structures and so on. And that part of it isn't happening. And so we've got a th almost certain uh, fall off in mining investment spending, but no clear idea that the, the rest of the business is going to fill that vacuum. And therefore, there is a possibility of a recession in this year or next, just because some part of the economy stops spending and the rest of the economy doesn't fill that gap. Uh, I don't know. I'll pick a number out of the hat. It's best to think of these things in terms of probability. I'd say there is maybe a 20% possibility that we'll have a recession this year or next year. Uh, it, that's that's uh, quite possible. And I wouldn't be honest if I didn't say that, even though I'm not one of the people who gets a lot of joy out of predicting doom and gloom for the economy, I don't. Um, but we'll see about that. And, and the, pro the, real, the thing that worries me most about it is this thing about uh, infrastructure. What the latest figures show is that there's been a fall off in government spending mm -hmm. on infrastructure. Now, the, most of that's coming from the states. It's actually the states that do most of the capital works investment. Uh, but really, that's, it's the public sector. There's a, there is a very good case that says we need more and better public infrastructure. And at a time when the miners, who've had all the heavy construction people up in up in the mining parts of Australia building things, at a time when they're telling them to pack up and go home, the state governments really ought to be getting out there and saying, now is actually a fabulous time for us to start building a lot of stuff because uh, the cost of doing it is down because you've got all these people who are looking for their next project and they will be... Uh, offering very keen contracts to get that that project so that they can hold their team together and generate some more income for, th for themselves. So the economy needs it and it's actually a very smart time for the taxpayers to be saying now's the time to step in. Not, we shouldn't have been, we didn't have to be doing it three years ago when we were competing against the mining industry to get the services of these people, now's the time to do it. And uh, if we do have a recession, a fair bit of the reason for it will be a failure of governments to step in and seize that opportunity and fill that gap. We've got time for a couple of really quick questions because this trio, they like to talk. Good? Yeah. Uh, my question is on the GST. I know it's a perennial topic, and I know you're all obviously economists, but where do you stand on the GST in terms of increasing it? Um, you've mentioned the states. You've mentioned how they need the funds to funnel that into infrastructure. So where do you see the GST heading? Should we increase it? Should we not? And the fiscal imperatives of that? I think that's to you. You're the economist. Okay. He's actually a registered, chartered, probably unregistered mm. now. He's a chartered. No, no, he's still I am registered. A, I am a fellow chartered accountant. Of the Institute yeah. of mm. Chartered Accountants. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Believe everything he says, <laughs> Ross. I think that's probably for 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 you. Yes. I was a great supporter of the GST, and I don't uh, regret that the introduction of the GST, but. I'm not prepared to support an argument that says we need to raise the rate or, or that we need to broaden the base, even though there are, there are good arguments there. I'm not prepared to support that when it is true that that is a regressive tax increase. It hits 
low income earners hard, proportionately harder than high income earners. Even if high income earners actually pay more dollars, they've got more income to pay the more dollars. At any rate, I'm not prepared to support that argument. I accept that the states need more revenue, but I'm not prepared to support it while we're doing this. We're going, oh, there's only, the only answer is terribly sorry, got to increase a regressive tax. When there are so many other ways that we can increase tax revenue that aren't regressive, starting with all the uh, tax concessions that are heavily skewed towards high income earners. And we keep hearing this notion we pay high company tax. Yes, we do, but very few point out that we have dividend, dividend imputation in Australia, which returns that to the shareholder. Uh, that's a quid pro quo. In effect, uh, um, Australian residents who invest pay very little um, company tax. Yeah, there are a bunch of countries, including the Nordic countries, which have quite low inequality and have higher consumption taxes than Australia does, um, but they have a much stronger... Um, multi-partisan commitment to keeping inequality low. They have bigger public sectors overall, they have more effective social spending. And so for me, I am really unwilling to um, look at increasing the GST or expanding it while Australia just doesn't have a strong public commitment to bring our inequality back yeah. under control because it's been going it's been going absolutely nuts. I just don't I agree with Ross. I don't think that GST increases should be on the table while super tax concessions yep. are offered. Um, just quickly, a quick example of um, private versus public um, inefficiencies. Uh, that I'm just, I'm, I'm doing a Cert 3 to, to get an entry level job into um, a new industry, into a, and the public one was TAFE is 2,500 and, and the private provider was 7,000. But just quick, but just moving on. Um, the government always says, like the Joe Hockeys, the IPA, um, say that the government should be smaller. They always say it should be smaller, and as pointed out with the um, Fraser, with Malcolm Fraser, that the government's been having razor gangs and, divid uh, and um, efficiency dividends, and as pointed out, there's not much more the government can go. Can so I need a really quick question? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just getting, getting to that. So what's, uh, what is the optimal size for government? You know, if the lowest point it can be in percentage of GDP or whatever to the, to the highest point? Uh, yeah, there's no one point. Um, I mean, what Samuelson pointed out about, uh, the, uh, the economist Paul Samuelson pointed out about, uh, 40 years ago, is that there is probably some point but we can't find it. But we can be fairly confident that uh, uh, either we are in step and another 16 or 17 countries are out of step, or uh, the, the alternative uh, explanation I think is far more appealing. We are well below that point of optimum size of government. And you know, one of the things we stress in our work is that Australia's prosperity has always been based on a mixed economy, with both the public and private sector working where they work best. But we have now been gripped with that ideology uh, to keep shrinking the public sector, and we are paying a high price for it. Please give our guests a very warm thank you. Thank you.